<laughs> okay, let's get started. So, um, so this is the uh, robotics and automation seminar series. Actually, this is a new seminar series uh, just starting from this uh, semester. Um, so, our plan for this uh, seminar series is we, you know, we plan to invite two to three uh, external speakers and one to two internal speakers for each semester. Um, the, today is the first uh, um, uh, seminar in this series. Okay. Um, so today's uh, seminar speaker is Professor Songbei King. Uh, he's a social professor from MIT and he's a director of uh, uh, Biomimic Robotics Lab. Uh, so Dr. King uh, has received uh, uh, many awards, uh, including uh, the best paper award for. Um, ICRA 2007 and uh, Kim Song Fu, a memorial transaction of robotic and IEEE ASEAN uh, transaction of robotic uh, uh, electronics in 2016, uh, DAPA Young uh, Faculty uh, uh, Award in 2017, and NS NSF Career Award in 2014, and uh, Ruth and Joe uh, Spira Award for Distinguished Teaching uh, in 2015. Uh, Dr. King's uh, uh, research uh, achievement, recent achievement, including uh, design of uh, you know, cheetah robot, you know, uh, as well uh, received you know um, uh, wide recognition in the world. Um, so the cheetah is capable of, of uh, uh, outdoor running uh, 30 miles per hour, and that's uh, uh, is probably the one of I mean the the, the fastest running quadruped uh, robot uh, actuated by electric motor. So, without further ado, let's welcome uh, Professor Zongbei King. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's a great honor to be here. This is actually the first time for me to visit. Uh, and I, I knew many faculty members here, but I uh, didn't quite come. So I'm glad to make here. And uh, thanks for coming. And uh, I'm happy to share what we've been doing in our lab and what we're really trying to achieve. Uh, as a goal. So um, I've been working on bio-inspired robot for uh, 15 years. And I study almost equally like biology and, and mechanical engineering. Kind of selectively, I only study like things that I'm interested in. But uh, and trying to really extract the principle from biology, I worked on gecko-inspired climbing robot. We invent the first directional adhesive. We can tell you more about it in an hour on the how gecko climb is fascinating and so on. Uh, but now I'm uh, moving to a little bit more practical direction. I'm thinking about, uh, I've been building many small robots and now I'm building, uh, I decided to make a big, little bit bigger robot so that we can actually do something. Because a lot of small robots eventually cannot carry sensor or uh, can apply large forces in, to the environment like, like the, the, the drones do. So i eventually developing a sizable machine and I'll tell you a little bit of story about that. <coughs> In a big picture, I want to step back and then tell you uh, what might the future uh, will be. I, it's not more like my personal perspective, but uh, you, you might notice that everybody spend quite a lot of time in, in this like IT, uh, the result of IT technology. We have technology, there are many, many technologies basically focusing on how to deliver information more effectively, faster, more efficiently, more conveniently. That's basically summary of IT technology and then we've been focusing on that for many many years like probably close to close to decade at least like two decades at least um, it was starting from internet like infra based now it's wireless and handheld devices and still going on there's still a lot to do yes they're reshaping our world and so on but how I see this uh, area uh, in the future I think it's gonna saturate pretty quickly it's already, I actually feel that it's already saturating. The region is, uh, it doesn't really deal with the physical energies. Well, what does that matter? Because that means the entry level the barrier is very low. You don't need to uh, spend too much time on other areas. You just need to focus on your programming world, the software world. You don't need to have a lab in your startup company. Your startup company just needs a few computers. Of course, you need the brain to brains, and uh, uh, but once you have that, once you can, uh, I have an idea, can change a, I, uh, you can have a better software, and if you launch through app, uh, Apple app or you know uh, uh, Android app, it takes a matter of weeks and months, not even a year, 
to spread out and then available to the world because it's all software, because it doesn't deal with the real physical energies. So that's why there's going to be a great opportunity, yes, but there are many, many competitors, and then the cycle of development is super fast because there are many competitors. So uh, our need doesn't change. Well, it changed a little bit, evolved, and then there's new, new need that's created. But it's going to be saturated really, really quickly. But compared to that, physical services where you can solve this problem by just writing a, code, a piece of code or writing a software, you have to actually actually deal with the physical energies. You have to apply forces, you have to uh, move things. Then it's not that easy. It takes for a while. If you think about how long our manufacturing role will evolve, how long it takes uh, for us to develop our cars in a more reliable way, it, if you think about the physical world, it takes forever. If you uh, think about heavier uh, industry, like shipbuilding industry, they haven't changed for like two decades, three decades. They changed some. Uh, uh, other stuff, but the, how they do is doesn't change really. So once you look at the physical services, uh, where we haven't quite uh, uh, tackled the delivery, a lot of people are looking at the delivery uh, situation. The way they uh, Amazon, we corporate the Amazon. You know, Amazon is probably shaping the world so that like most people, are, there are more and more people are ordering online rather than going there purchasing, burning their uh, uh, fat in their legs. Um, and their delivery uh, need going up, and their Amazon is like nitpicking. They're like doing all kinds of analysis to minimize, reduce like 0.01 percent of time to deliver everything because there's the the mass is really big. That those are all like costs for them. Elderly care, you know, the el uh, uh, elderly population is growing really rapidly. Japan is already having uh, pretty high. I, I I heard that there's one town in Japan has. Uh, 40,000 people over 100 year old or something like that. And uh, Korea, Japan, together, they're like, uh, in 2050, uh, people over 65 will, 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 uh, uh, will be about 45% or something of the entire population. And Northern Europe is not that different. China is a little bit, but still same trend. And US is actually better, best, I think, in terms of the age. We're still young. But still, you, you look at the overall uh, globe, I think the elderly population growing is rapid. And then it's, you have to think about what does it really entail in the society. We're losing labor in the, our industry, yes. But that you have to think about uh, increasing need of labor. Like we have more people who need the uh, physical services. We have a double trouble basically. We lose, we need more, we're losing the labor in the real industry, but actually need more labor to simple labor to help uh, 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 elderly people. So we have to really think about how to provide physical services. We cannot just solve this. Oh, we launched new app that handled the uh, elderly care and the lack of uh, physical service in the industry. It's not going to happen. You, you probably know that that's not going to happen by uh, looking at it, by understanding it. And <coughs> companionship is one thing probably. Farming, I think farming is probably the most, how can I say, uh, um, uh, advanced in this field, they're rapidly updating. They're actually using a lot of uh, IT technology, uh, navigation technology, automation technology. They're probably the uh, most pioneering uh, people. They're uh, updating new technology. There's still a lot to do. Construction, I think that that's one thing I think is uh, have a big opportunity and hasn't quite adopted this like new technology yet. There are some conservatism and their issues and so on, but I think there's a lot of opportunity. People are getting more injured, easily injured still. They're still building buildings pretty much the same way, and a lot more people uh, people are in, getting injured, and uh, there are a lot of things we can prevent uh, by applying new technology. Home security is one thing. Disaster response is something we're looking at far uh, uh, ahead of time, but uh, that's sort of like one of our ultimate goal. If we think about all these physical services, it doesn't make sense if you uh, opt out mobility. You can't really service without being able to move around. And then I'll briefly talk about mobility and uh, if you look at the history of human, uh, humankind. I feel like we did really well in all three domains, air, and water, and the ground. Uh, but I kind of want to draw a line between these two, uh, water and air and the ground. And then do you see any distinctiveness? What, what distinguished these two and this one? Anybody see that as a... If I, everybody is slightly different, but I, draw, I, I, I have a, I want to, you know, draw a line between this. Anybody has an idea what really distinguish these? 
Wheels? Wheels? Yeah. Yes. Well, I guess we cannot use wheels in the water and air. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Individualized transportation. Individualized transportation. Individualized. I guess we can we, we well, I guess we have a personal boat. I have a kayak. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some student actually about a human powered flight uh, is possible. Uh, anything else? I want you to look at this part. You can manipulate the world um, with on the ground side. Yeah. You can push it around. Y yes. So we actually change our world to make this guy available. We didn't quite change our water. Maybe the, our ports are different now, but that doesn't mean we're changing the water or CO2. We can't quite change our air. We can't manipulate gravity, right? We go to solve for a higher level. We can't quite manipulate these two. We create a road to make this guy available. And if you look at the big difference, these are fluid. This is not. And then if you think about the impedance perspective, the difference between fluid and, and solid, can't even compare. I don't know what metric you have to think about. It's just a, a way too different. If you think about the difference between the animal world to the uh, engineering world, you can have a probably hours of argument about these two differences. But to me, this has a bigger difference than others. Yes, these are very complex. Those are really, really complex. Much more complex than our counterpart, yes. But I can't compare with this difference. We use 600 muscles. Where most like 680 muscles are always. Most of them are active while walking or running. Yet we need two motors to do this. And how we can do this? Because we change it. We change our environment. We made a flat road so that we can use this. I can. I'm 80 kilogram, pretty small. Because I can jump on this table. How big the vehicle should be to be able to do that? Humvee? I don't think Humvee can climb up this. You probably need a tank. 30 ton. Yet, yeah, like squirrel can jump on this. We, we have to change the environment. Why? So why is that? Why um, we have to have a, such a complex system, uh, whereas these are fine? Because these are actually a lot more challenging. They are trying to say that is because you guys are all legged machines, and we live with it. You see that all the time. So we actually don't realize how difficult it is. This is like a, you're like a CEO or president of the company and then you don't know how to change this factory. Like uh, we move the factory from here to here, here. How is it difficult? You know, if you actually look at the actual working environments, you know that how difficult it is. But you probably don't know because you're sitting in the CEO's chair. Your brains are all like that. You actually don't know what's going on in your body. I can talk about that on an hour. I have actually a lecture uh, series on that. but. You are, you are not, you, your uh, conscious part of brain your con uh, uh, is actually very, very small and then most people don't realize that. You have to really appreciate uh, a lot of things going on subconsciously in your body. So the reason why this is hard because it's, uh, you have to, first of all, you have to deal with a hard environment. And where these are soft environment, why does that matter? Here, your ground, your forces from the like, getting the environment is actually mostly dominated by the geometry. I'm not really saying that geometry control is much easier than force control, but you can uh, see it. You can copy. If you copy almost the exact motion of bird, and then you create that in a robotic system and throw it in the air, it will do 90% work. If somebody motion captures human and then replicate the robot, it's not going to work at all. Why? Because your impedance is high, your stiffness is high, which means your force to displacement ratio is much, much higher. I can give you an example. If I do weight shifting really quickly left and right, can you see any of those? You see a little vibration, but you don't see much change. I just probably change like five-fold difference in forces on the ground. That basically determines the acceleration of my body. You can see it. Because our ground is hard. If I do that in the air and water, you will see it. And another difficulty is you have to change between high impedance, low impedance all the time. What moves you? Your, your legs are moving, right? Your legs are constantly moving in the air, which is very low impedance. You're not even swinging. We're not really even think, thinking about this effect. And then you have to deal with the collision. Now you're suddenly much, much higher impedance. And you do that cyclically all the time. Sometimes it goes a frequency change, sometimes a strike change. So it actually ended up being way more difficult than these two 
even. We think the flying is a lot more difficult because we can do it. Now my two-year-old son can walk. That doesn't mean it's easy. The human tends to judge the difficulty of certain tasks depends on what we can do. Oh my god, the computer can beat a chess on the, on the best chess player in the world. The must really, really intelligent. Your mirror neuron is fooling you. I, grasping a, a mouse like this is million times more difficult than play, uh, beating a chess in the computer world. And we don't realize that because it's so easy for us. But yet, you are not really realizing how much of that is actually automatic. You don't even know where the computation is happening. So that's why I believe that this is not like uh, any statement or something. You know, the, the land animal evolved to be the land, like the most advanced. We believe that the mammals and primates are actually most advanced, the latest uh, uh, generation of the evolution. I think it probably is probably hard to move around the land and then survive well. It takes probably much longer uh, to evolve and it requires much higher intelligence. Let's go, go back to the uh, uh, robot story. And then we are talking about physical services. And then what are the physical services happening in the current world? Um, there are own factories. Um, and they're amazing. If you've been in any factory, you'll be probably amazed by, wow, it's all automated. There's no barely a human. And they're faster, they're much more precise, they're incredibly consistent. They're like a million times more consistent than human, a thousand times more accurate than people. And they're stronger because they're bigger. Um, and uh, what's wrong with it? They are amazing, yet they're not actually touching anything. What do you mean? How can you work without touching? Oh, they're touching, but they're approaching very, very slowly. If, if when it comes to a uh, task where you need a lot of tactile feedback, it's all done by human. Every single cell phone you guys have is all assembled by human. You can, if you think about what distinguish, uh, what robot can do, what robot cannot do, is basically where uh, can that task can be 100%, like 99.999% guarantee by this commanding position or not. Think about putting a leather, the leather on the, uh, the car seat, uh, pushing against the uh, cushions and, and soft, uh, soft materials. If you, can you come up with a trajectory that guarantee the finish of the task? You can't. If there's too much variability, there are certain things that you have to actually meet the force requirement. When you assemble a snap feet of plastic, you have to actually hear the sound and sensation to understand that all that's been done. It, the end of position can vary a lot depending on the material, depending on the situation. When it comes to any soft material, that the cables and that have rubber pieces, you can't guarantee a complete task by just commanding a position. In other words, all these robots are only executing position trajectory. And there's no sense of intelligence or force speed rate whatsoever. And there are people trying to implement that in the, in the factory. It's pretty difficult. Um, uh, so, that, so that's how the robotics industry, robotics technology in, in, in the factory has been evolved for the last 60 years or so. It's the first one, 61. The Unimate is like 61, so it's like uh, 60 years or so, right? And they're getting more stiff, more precise, faster. So there are, these robots are designed to be moving sculpture. I'm not sure that makes sense to you. It is moving, but any time of time, if you hit it, it is sculpture because that's how you actually get the high accuracy, high position accuracy repeatability. So let's take a look at the other attempt. This is a uh, robotics challenge, a DARPA robotics challenge. And then you'll find that these robots are, it's not the algorithm issue. They, the hardware are still uh, staying in this manufacturing error. They are still position control. <laughs> you can see that. They, are, they don't change configuration. And they're still using the same component. If you take it apart, you'll find the same component, like harmonic drive, 300 to 1. You can find exactly the same thing in our uh, manufacturing world. They just reconfigure that it looks like a superhero, but they are actually still commanding in the same uh, uh, end command. High level command, there are a lot of advanced the vision feedback, there's a the state estimator, and so on going on, but their low level control is still the same as a manufacturing robot. And then that's where things are very different from animal. And this is, Probably many of these animals are very, very young too. Probably a few weeks old. These animals can actually run full speed uh, in a matter of a minute after birth. Some people think, oh, we have to learn a lot. Not necessarily. 
these are like 70 degrees, 60 degrees. Think about how accurate all these animals in terms of position accuracy. Probably not even a millimeter. They're probably a centimeter off. If I execute behind my head, my position accuracy goes down to like inch. We're not about accuracy. We're not that accurate, but we have a much higher intelligence to take care of something else. We don't even know how they do it. We don't even know how I'm standing and not falling apart while talking to you, looking around yourself. Um, so there are many things we have to think about and then challenge, but the one thing I'm talking about today, we don't even have an idea how to design a machine different from this world. These are the world where we know every position. In the factory, everything is uh, uh, known. Everything knows where everything is. And then structure the environment, which, uh, and then you, you need a high precision speed to tackle the task. All these robots are anchored on the ground, so they don't need to worry about falling. Whatsoever. When it comes to mobile application, this is one of the extreme cases of the DARPA uh, uh, drawing. When it comes to mobile application, you don't know many of these. Like, you don't know the exact accurate position of this conference room every, every day. It's different, changing all the time. If you go to your home, it's a very close to actual disaster situation. Your toys are rolling around. I step on my son's train all the time, and it's very annoying. Um, balance matter because you're not anchored anymore. If the mobile robot is an can anchor on the ground, if you if you're working in like modifiable environment, you can drill a hole and then anchor yourself. Things are way way easier. You have to balance yourself, and then force control matter a lot more than position control. Yes, when those like the uh, snow leopard chasing down the boat, your foot placement is critical, but not sub millimeter accurate is critical. Your force control matters a lot more. Posture balance a lot more. So we need to think about how to change the design paradigm, not let alone talking about intelligence. There's just too much unknown in the intelligence world. At least we know what's been lacking in the design world. So many people uh, study on this actuation world and then how to make it more like biological muscle. And uh, the current gearboxes are not like this, it's a harmonic drive, but this represents like a very high gear ratio. And this is typical manufacturing rewarding arm. Very stiff, very high gear ratio, very high inertia. Effective inertia matters the most, in my opinion. And have a very stiff sensor, so if you hit something we're not supposed to, it stops. You can react on anything. Uh, no matter how fast your algorithm, how fast your communication loop, it doesn't matter the, tr the shock travel in a matter of like uh, several thousand meters per second. And your Actuator is actually bandwidth is like two, three order magnitude smaller than that. So no matter what algorithm you have, you can't handle shock. So they start adding sprint, for example. I will show you some example of that. Uh, well, I can't. It doesn't have it. So like uh, those robots you saw in Ashimo, even in, including Ashimo, those are all built that way. It's moving sculpture constant. And then people start adding spring, so that oh, I can spring can absorb energy. Sometimes you can store energy. You can recycle it. This is one of the promising result and there are people are, several people are uh, applying this. We are actually uh, pro approaching very differently. We uh, uh, take a look at inertial space and the friction space. It's much better not to have a gear, many gear reduction and uh, also beneficial to minimize the inertia by uh, having light length and then maximizing the torque density so you can minimize the gear reduction ratio. Uh, and there's multiple benefits, like not having additional sensor, uh, not having spring that makes our force band is high. You can talk about that a lot, but uh, basically this is a, a, if anybody recognizes this phantom, this is basically a phantom on steroid. We, our approach is pretty much same as how phantom did in 1994. Uh, but uh, we basically re-engineer the actuator world so that uh, same performance available in the high force world. Those phantoms are fantastic, but those are very weak. Yeah, the force band force limit is very low. It's not available for leg locomotion. Uh, this is a video from 2010. Uh, we basically, oh, that's interesting. Uh, create a robotic leg uh, where it can observe energy. That's a critical noted notion. Uh, uh, we, have you seen any machine in the world when you purchase product, whatever, even a lab, have a stack of negative power. Anybody saw it? Anybody seen any machine? If you go to racing world, they talk about braking power. I'm not sure they put wattage on it, but braking power is critical in the racing. That's actually more critical than uh, acceleration capability. I actually 
drove a, a racing, racing uh, not racing car, but the race uh, uh, in a pretty high performance car and BMW driving experience. And then I couldn't believe how hard it can break. <laughs> and and I, I couldn't pull all the way, but my partner was like breaking like crazy. But if you think about it, in many things in the world, including your, 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 uh, your business or you, even your task, if you cannot absorb, you can't actually do any positive work. You cannot create an event not thinking about uh, taking care of a complaint, taking care of services. You can't jump without thinking about landing, basically. And if you, anybody doing sports here, like uh, baseball or tennis, your body is actually amazing. Your body, uh, if you don't tell your body, if you don't train your body, your body actually holds you down, like holds you down an acceleration period. Let's say, you know, the, a lot of baseball players actually, they lift weight and backward. They, uh, they exercise a deceleration muscle. They, call, they just name for it, deceleration muscle. Tennis player too, they need to ex exercise the opposite side of the muscle so that you can accelerate at the maximum. Your muscles are actually way more powerful than you think, you way you feel. Your, many of your muscles in your body is strong that they rip out your tendon. It actually happened to me once in my life, unfortunately. I think it's some software bug. Um, <laughs> we have our software bug, and that's how you fall sometimes. And But your, a lot of regulation basically protect your, uh, your body from your muscle. Your muscles are super high force. Not necessarily high power, but a very high force. Uh, but if you know that you can handle the kinetic energy of arm, uh, by like uncomfortable position where your deceleration muscles are not strong enough, at the acceleration period, your body's like, don't do that. And even though you force you to do that with this strong spirit, you're gonna hurt when you decelerate because you're prematurely holding down. That's how you tear your muscles. So when you lift something, and then you tear your back muscle because your leg is producing too much force, and then your back is not ready to, in that position, that load, you're holding too prematurely to tear the muscle. So you have to tell them, I'm gonna go there, so don't freak out. And then it's not going to happen. That's why you have to stretch before your exercise. Going back to the topic to uh, deviate too much. Absorption, negative power is actually critical in many, many situations, not only in this uh, locomotion. Um, so basically, there's many things we can talk about. But the, the first thing, you need to be able to absorb shock. You can't do anything fast. Those manufacturing moves are fast, but whenever they contact, they're very, very slow because they're not capable of uh, absorbing energy. Even grasping this, like a pencil, my finger collide everywhere, and then these are those are the, my fingers are capable of absorbing energy, so that I can move quickly. Otherwise, if I'm like a manufacturing robot, I have to do this. I, even though I move really fast, I have to slowly, slowly grasp them so there's no collision. But we don't even have hardware kit to that. So before we actually do this, so using that kind of like a new kind of paradigm of actuator, we built the first Chira. It looks awesome, but very incapable. Um, it could only run in a straight line uh, with some support. And then we did some fun, very simple type of actuator, like trying to jump and break the spine, uh, and so on. And Chira 2 is basically uh, a lot more practical, and then uh, it shows some promise. <clears throat> uh, we've been talking about Lego Ro Robot for many decades, but People are keep on saying that ah, still wheels are better. Still wheels are definitely better. I think we're we're in the transition. We start seeing things we can do with the uh, the wheeled robot, and then we can do with the leg robot. So um, it's not even using full power. Uh, the bottleneck is always stability control control algorithm. Um, can turn not very well. We rely on this like pretty bad actuator on this and you can jump autonomously. So think about handling that kind of obstacle, how big your vehicle should be, think about it. And again, jumping a lot, of, wow, your robot jumped through that. Jumping is really easy, just apply some impulse. Think about landing, if you cannot jump, this robot actually can jump higher, but it cannot land if you jump higher. That's limiting your capability, and then many cases, if you think about, you're trying to do something, or trying to apply for a bigger job, or Try to tackle new tasks. So you have to think about stress. Oh, can I handle that stress? Can I handle that body stress? If you cannot observe, you cannot do it. One really good benefit of this uh, kind of paradigm is you don't need uh, any uh, sensor. Well, you need a sensor, but you can do a lot without sensor at the end detector. There's no uh, sensor whatsoever you can detect because we let the energy flow into the system. 
can basically feel the energy instead of actual touch. Um, Are you asking the leg to stop when it makes contact? So this one uh, is actually the algorithm we use in the Cheetah one okay. uh, because time-based control is always, there's a potential to go unstable. So this uh, swing control actually waiting to hit the ground. If you hit early, uh, I think it automatically go to the ground phase. If you are not hit, hit, uh, reach the uh, end of swing too, too early, and then wait until you hit the ground. So that keep the, uh, the, the what is it called, the frequency in, in, in control. Yeah. So this is the swing control of the This is a swing control, very simple swing control of the Cheetah one. And Cheetah to Cheetah 3 is different. <coughs> but, but this contact detection is always there. Cheetah 2 we have it, Cheetah 3 we have it. But then yeah. you're not doing impedance control, endpoint impedance control or something. <coughs> so this is impedance control until it reached the end effector. But if you hit something before, it goes to ground phase. If you it doesn't hit until the end, you wait. So that makes the, uh, the, the stipe frequency stable. Otherwise, it can go by frequency. It goes unstable. Too. And then what we talk about this as a by, uh, backdrop ability, that's probably most used in the robotics world. It's an intuitive term, but it's not really well described, well defined term. So we actually, Patrick, he's an uh, uh, alumni in OSU, he basically come up with this terminology. It's an IMF, it's a terrible name. It's not in this international monetary fund. It's actually impact mitigation factor. Uh, basically, we present the uh, end effector workspace mode of mass inertia, mass matrix. Um, but if you can, if you just calculate the mass matrix, so you can just intuitively think if you have a mass matrix represented at the end effector. What do you mean by that? Well, your your mass at the end effector is not only represented by the, these masses. You have to think about other things that are moving. In the robotics world, their motors are always attached to the gearbox. And then when, in order to move this end effector, you have to accelerate those other inertia. So you have to actually calculate more accurately. And then that depends on what gear ratio you have, what kind of inertia you have on your leg, and how light your leg length is. But the mass to mass matrix end effector represent how heavy you are when you hit the ground, how easily you can mitigate the impact, yes. But you can compare with the 100 kilogram robot to one kilogram robot, right? You want to have some normalized uh, value. So he basically called it, a, how about uh, just compare with the worst case scenario? What do you mean by worst case scenario? Imagine your robots are real uh, sculpture. <laughs> Somebody hot glue, a super glue, every joint, and then hit the ground, and then what is the, the, the mass matrix? Compare that with your real mass matrix. Aha, uh -huh. so now you can actually uh, uh, normalize that mass matrix, and then assuming your falling loss is the same, now you can quantify how backdroppable, well, how good your machine is designed for impact, independent from your mass, independent from uh, uh, your other effect. Okay. So that's how it's defined. That's how you compare uh, IMF. This is actually uh, scholar, but you can actually tease out directional uh, effect. If you have any question, I can answer this question. In this case, it give you one number. Um, all jumble up uh, three-dimensional uh, space. Um, and in this case, we compare with the other machines like high gear, typical high gear ratio humanoid, their impact mitigation factor is much lower. It changes depending on the configuration because your mass may change, it could be a change. Uh, and then our starlet is actually the machine with the series elastic. So all the actuator inertia is actually shielded from the ground. And yet, our cheetah, which there's no compliance, all the recently tests, we're actually a similar level because we're, our inertia is that low. That's how we can allow the energy to go through the, the motor, and then the uh, robot can be inherently compliant. This is based on your model of their robots? This is uh, based on our model of a uh, robot, and then they publish all the inertia parameter and the gear ratio. And only another robot we can get the data is actually Hugo. That's why we collect those three. If you ask around, probably you can collect more. But now we have a metric we can talk about instead of, oh, how good your vector ability. Uh, decent, uh, good enough. Like, it's, it's not enough to really quantify how well your machines are suited to having physical interaction. Um, a lot of people ask me why you don't have a spring, and then this is basically the answer. Uh, including Cheetah 3, this is Cheetah 2, but uh, our transmission from the motor to the foot is all as 
highest possible. Our stiffness is like the maximized. We have a plastic leg that kind of like, uh, there's some issue, but the, there's other reason why we have plastic leg. But basically I'm showing uh, what the robot is commanding as a ground action force, and effective ground action force, and then what's been measured. So it's not feedback loop, it's actually just comparing how good our force control is. And then red is real, you see a lot of impact spikes, which you cannot control no matter what you have. And then blue is what the robot is actually commanding. And then you can see the quality is like so-so, like 10%, 20% error, which is terrible for most for the control world. But I want you to take a look at time uh, scale. This is an 80 millisecond. We're controlling order of like 50 to 100 kilogram amount of force in the matter of like 80 millisecond to 100 millisecond. 80 millisecond is an accident in most of the time. Your blinking eye takes about four, 300 to 400 millisecond. And we have to, we actually can control the shape of this, not in the extreme, but the magnitude and the shape of the x, y uh, forces in the matter of uh, 80 millisecond. Uh, this is a big deal in the leg locomotion, and no, not many people will understand that because some people are like, why do you need that high, high, high force bandwidth? How, uh, and then I got to answer that that's all time we have. When cheetah, real cheetah running 70 mile per hour, the each foot, each leg stay on the ground about 45 minutes a second. That's all time you have. That, if you cannot control force during that time, you're going to fall. You can run. I believe actually human, when human reach maximum speed cannot run anymore, this probably can't control the ground force well, you will fall. One, one limiting factor is a swing speed. You can swing fast enough that we maximize the ground time. And, but I think stability is probably the bottleneck, first bottleneck. You will kind of lose balance and you fall. And you have to be able to control this. When you guys are running and jogging around, even not the maximum speed, your ground time is about 150 millisecond. Even when you're walking, your ground time is about, you know best, right? That 500 milliseconds? Half a second or something. Half a second or something. That's not the long time. But you have to control whole body, applying all kind of forces that time. And then if you're thinking about, oh, force feedback control or some conventional control, there's no way you can do it. You need to have a high force bend bend this actuator without having any feedback, because any feedback will, will make you unstable. And this is probably unprecedented data in the robotics world. Like we're controlling 100 new kilogram, 50 to 100 kilogram level force happening in the 80 millisecond. That's why we're maximizing transmission stiffness. We can maximize force bandwidth. Yet we're actually can observe energy uh, much much better than in other uh, approaches. All boils down to IMF. That's a critical metric. Yet, uh, make robot dynamic, powerful, make things uh, more exciting. Things are happening. So you see a lot of holes in our lab. We have a, bu we have a bucket of leg in our lab. We have a bucket that filled with a plastic leg. I'm not sure if you've seen it. Uh, we break the leg uh, a matter of like two days, a day. We, when I was working on this, I actually went down to the lab at least three times in a time and fixed the leg. Change like that's why you have plastic like could have been a mistake if I use aluminum from the beginning, could have been much less of an issue. But I don't want to like have a bent aluminum that I take a way longer time to fix. I think there's some uh, risk analysis can be done. I will show you what we're doing right now, anyway. Uh, I want to show the energy efficiency um, of Chira 2, and you know, there's no percentage kind of concept in energy efficiency because. When transport something from A to B, your mechanical output is a zero always. So if you apply kind of thermodynamics like conventional efficiency, you're always zero. So you can't really compare it from one to another. That's why you go to car dealer and you ask mileage instead of percentage of engine. Like, you know, what is your uh, car efficiency? And then nobody answered like 90%, 95%. We answered with mileage. How long can you travel with a given gas? And this is pretty much the same uh, as that. It's called the cost of transport. It's used in the biomechanics community. And these are the data from the animal. And these are uh, x-axis that represent the mass. So one represents 10 kilogram, 100 kilogram, 1,000 kilogram. You can see horse here, human here, dog here. And you can see heavier animals tend to have a lower number. So in this world, heavier animals are more efficient. Uh, how, why is that? I don't think I can answer. It's, it's something just we have. And maybe you can speculate the, uh, the 
the reason why, but we don't have a great answer yet. Let's, we can at least compare a certain uh, individual compared with the general trend. And human is actually better than most animal. And we believe that human has a longer leg per mass. If you think about a dog my size, probably legs are much shorter. Um, Honda Shimo is about seven times worse. Uh, Chira is actually pretty good. Well, you think the Chira is just optimized for speed. It doesn't mean it has to be efficient. It has to be efficient. Uh, hydraulic machines, maybe it's not fair to use a big dog as a hydraulic machine there because they have a better hydraulic machine. But we don't have a number. I just barely get the number from somebody. It's the best one I saw was like five, which is already 10 times worse than animal. Um, our cheetah is actually better than animal at this point. And then I'm not proud of it. Um, if you really think about it, we're comparing uh, cost of transport calculated through the electricity consumption and compared with the animals who go through all kinds of fat breakdown to all the process going to the ATP and then ATP become ATP. So if somebody can quantify ATP consumption as a cost, cost uh, uh, probably it will be much, much lower. And we don't know the exact number. Uh, so if you use electricity, well, what is electricity as a fuel? I think it's a really refined version of energy. If you compare like the gasoline to electricity, there's this energy efficiency associated with that, right? And animal data is pretty much uh, that include uh, that efficiency. So we should actually beat animal very easily, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, at least we should be the kangaroo. That's our goal. <laughs> kangaroo is weird. Um, if you're interested, I can tell you. Kangaroo, if you should, the energy cost transfer actually plateau. Like, it's a weird animal. They use spring a lot. That's why they're uh, very efficient. So, uh, in order to achieve a high IMF uh, machine, we actually had to design our own motors. I'll show you that that's not always the case. One of my brilliant uh, students uh, design machine without even using any fancy motor. These are really expensive motor, by the way. This is a commercial motor, 900 bucks. This is a custom-built, hand-wound motor, uh, $4,000. This is $10,000 motor we never produce anymore. Uh, it's, first of all, very expensive, and then it doesn't produce the estimated number. It's actually much lower. So actually, we're using right now this one. And this is uh, exceptionally powerful compared to other motors, but powerful, forceful, not powerful. Um, uh, but it's way too expensive and then very dangerous. Uh, if you don't have a good idea what 27 Newton meter means, uh, we have a gear ratio of like a 10 in our Chira 3, which means it makes, uh, uh, it makes this guy produce 250 Newton meter, which is bigger than uh, uh, Honda Accord engine. Honda Accord sedan uh, engine produce about 180 Newton meter. So our Chira leg, we have a 12 joint. Each joint can beat those engine. So uh, you can do something like this. This is unpublished. Uh, we're never going to publish this <laughs> data where we, we apply a human. Uh, we apply about 260 Newton meter on human body, probably the world history and, and record. Uh, probably you should put in the Guinness book. You can see the, with the suit, it starts much later, reach the same height, which means higher acceleration. It reached 13% of uh, jumping, which is exciting. It's a simulation says 49. 13%, and they showed me the video, like, that's 13%? It's only this much. And that's not how, how much jump, human jump. Well, our metric is uh, from standing COM to jump COM. It's not that much. Human jump only this much. So 13% is quite significant. That makes it, uh, 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 allow him to dunk. He couldn't dunk before. <laughs> now we can dunk because it's significant, right? But there's a lot of things we can learn from here. You know, how how for, how much how forceful your hip is. Your hip is hard to define, but your 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 was estimated to be uh, uh, one joint. Human hip in this in his uh, size in his uh, uh, weight, he can generate about 300 newton meter, which is pretty impressive. You know, humans are really high force. High torque, it doubled the heat torque, and get barely 30% improvement. And why is that? First of all, the torque double doesn't mean height double. First of all, and the second, we use way more joints to jump. The ankle is actually pretty critical to jump. We are not helping any of those. 
And third is having six kilogram piece of rigid pieces wrapped around the body and then rub against all the time. So you can take a look at the posture difference between free with the six kilogram device. And you're only applying torque in one joint, so the human has to adapt and probably it's not a good adaptation. And so that 30% should be very respectable. That's pretty impressive. Yet, you'll realize a lot of other challenges. He actually get chafed. He got chafed everywhere because this device is applying 260 Newton meter on the bottom. What was the controller on the device? Uh, controller is pretty simple. It detects the uh, hip joint angular velocity. And the angular velocity flip, it just uh, applying torque in a certain direction. So we had to practice like from 20 Newton meter. Oh, I feel that, I feel that. And then jump multiple times and then increase 30, increase 40, 50. So the reason why we cannot publish because, but think about that, how much it, it would take. People are very underestimating how torqueful, I don't know torqueful is a good word, <laughs> our human body is. And then how much it takes to get that with the high IMF because we can have a device, uh, now backdrop device around your body because it's very uncomfortable. Even our device is very uncomfortable, I have to say that. I want to introduce Chira 3, which is the most advanced uh, in our lab. We have about three tiers of computer, I guess four tiers including vision. Uh, and there are different frequencies, like 20 kilohertz, 5 kilohertz, 100, uh, kilohertz. Uh, now it's like 20 hertz from the vision. It's about 40 kilograms, it's actually heavier than Chira 2 because it has more motors, more heavier motors. Uh, legs are simplified. Uh, we love three leg, leg, but it's want to be stronger and more robust. Um, each joint can generate like 200 to 300 Newton meter, which actually is uh, lower than the first word. First word. We actually modify a little bit. <coughs> I'll show you the video. This is uh, published uh, recently, uh, but uh, just in case who didn't see it, I'll show you. <coughs> Just to let you know, the while just showing the body posture, controllers are just static controller. So looking at the current state, and then apply torque to generate the wrench on the body. And then all is instantaneous, there's no predicting, no dynamics whatsoever. And once you start moving, I think this is probably even static controller. This is uh, based on our, it's called the quadrant programming, the solving of what kind of force you need to generate to generate the wrench. Here, we're actually using a linear MPC, so model predictive control. We're actually uh, looking ahead about half a second in the future, and then what's going to happen if I apply this kind of torque in the half second in the future, and then we hope round, uh, run the optimization about 20 hertz. So we are solving uh, 20 times in a second. What's the model for the optimization? Uh, for optimization, is one reason body. Okay. If you add one more mass, love with that, you can't do it. Yeah. Great thing about leg robot, you can command directions and directional movement, whatever you want. You can turn left going right, or turn right going left, like 90 degree going, it doesn't matter, you can command whatever. Uh, it's like Omni wheels kind of like uh, uh, version, uh, equivalent. Of the, uh. <coughs> you see that body pitch is a little off, that's a result of the MPC, because you're predicting the future and the model's not perfect. There's always a uh, residual error. We actually fix it now, but uh, that's the kind of co cost. So we, that's why you have to mix with the static, like a current state feedback to future prediction feedback. This is all uh, purely based on our uh, posture controller. It doesn't know there's a stairs. Only thing we change is uh, we swing high up. And then this controller is exactly the same controller as you saw in the other controller. And somewhere the time is different, but the all same MPC running to climb up and climbing down. What fraction of the body mass is leg mass? I don't know on top of my head, it's like something like 10 to 1. Yeah. Because, you know, how would you, it could be, like there's a rotation rate that way bigger than, right. Uh, linear inertia and so on, so <laughs> it's hard to answer that. Uh, and of course, high torque and motor allow you to kind of stop. So, uh, table is no longer an obstacle. For some people, like, oh my god, now you cannot hide behind the table. <laughs> you know that it's, it's a silly uh, thing to think about. The 
the, the intelligence is, uh, is really far, far from. I want to just point out one thing we do in the, uh, uh, kind of like going back to this like challenge in transitioning from air to in the ground. Uh, in the air, because in the air, you only control the position control, typical conventional position control. But once you hit in the ground, your legs are in charge of applying forces on the body so that your body is in the right, right uh, shape. And that transition is quite tricky. You cannot just detect the force and then uh, uh, transition because there are a lot of other, other issues. So you don't want to transition when you hit something in the middle. So we actually combine uh, three probability, like the swing phase, are you, where, where are you in terms of the swing phase? How high are you from the ground, from your state estimator, your prediction of the ground, and then how much force you're getting? So all these three probability has to be combined, and then you conclude that, okay, now I think it's safe to uh, declare that you're on the ground, so we're gonna change the control. Because in the ground is force control, if you do that prematurely, leg is gonna shoot out. And because the impedance difference, again, going back to the first mobility uh, conversation, your control instability is depending on which impedance you're dealing with. If you're dealing with the ground impedance and applying uh, for controller for like a low impedance thing, you won't do anything. If you're applying the same controller you're dealing with high impedance in the air, you're gonna shoot out and it's going crazy stuff. So I'll show you the difference between the contact Detection with without. This is a without. Um, so it's time based. You just command and switch the controller based on time. And you see that the body lose contact because the legs are not doing right thing in the right timing. And then once you uh, switch on the contact detection, you can see it's a lot more stable because it doesn't generate the unwanted force and then it. It immediately switched to the uh, body control mode as soon as it uh, hit the ground. So those are actually pretty critical uh, in our uh, whole body dynamics. That's why you cannot solve this problem by just like solving, like applying one learning uh, technology or like some nonlinear control technique. It's not going to work because it's actually quite nasty world. Our contact is not even uh, modeled properly. So obviously, robot doesn't know anything about this obstacle, and then this obstacle flips, and then when the leg, like briefly in the air, doesn't mean it's going to go into the swing control because our probability says that don't freak out. You already, uh, it's a commitment. It's more like, a, are you committed? The ground, you have to stay committed. Um, a lot of people are like, whoa, why don't you use the vision to make it better? If you use make a vision, probably possibly get a little more precise. It's gonna be much slower, in my opinion. It's not it's not gonna say that we're not gonna use vision. We are actually adding vision. We actually sense already views that uh, our visions, IMU vision, uh, fusion is actually better than IMU only. IMU only is orange, it drifts all the time. And our uh, fused state estimation is red. And then OptiTrack, which is the Vicon system, the, the camera system is green. So our fused data is a lot better. Um, uh, if you look at the real sense, which is the only vision, only camera, only is blue, which is actually not that bad, but you see that the little delay. You see that, I'm not sure it's not, you can see it's hard to read, but the blues are a little bit phase shifted. Uh, the reason why is the vision is slow, right? Vision has a frame rate, and then 30 frames per second, you have to also analyze those data, and then go back to, oh, this is where you are, and then you're too late. You're too late for controlling your body. So we actually use IMU to fill this gap. So that's where sensor fusion really work really well. Camera is always accurate if you know what's ground. Like if you camera register, this is ground. And if you shake around, no matter what, it will, it will tell me this is the ground. But the problem is it's the leg. But IMU is faster. So IMU is drifting and inaccurate. But that's how you uh, re-zero with the camera. But the IMU take care of the fast dynamics. And this is uh, our first slam. We've been really slow in this area because we were not expert, and then I had to kind of convince my student, like, this is going to be fun. I can't teach you much, <laughs> but there are a lot of packages you can use. Uh, so real, using real sense, my student just like stretched their his brain to learn from other packages, and then uh, he basically built map. The stitching is done by Aprotech. We wish we can do that better, but that's a pretty hard problem. Uh, we're probably gonna ask help from other people. So thanks to the tech, the 
mapping is done correctly, the stitching is done properly. Um, so we're going to uh, apply simple control like a gradient, uh, uh, like potential field or so, so that robot is not going to hit anything, uh, you see. Yet again, you know, you can't really compare with the animals. Make ourselves always humble. This is a, not a cat, this is actually a lion. Probably 300 pounds or so. Jump off the cliff, that's like easily three story, like third floor or so. And look at the intelligence. They work in tandem. Second always come in late, so you can catch in the air. Goat has a, doesn't have wings, you can <laughs> and land and splash in the ground in the body of the ground. It's incredible robustness. Um, we've been talking about mobility for a while, but we can't just solve problem by just moving around. So you need to have a manipulation. You can talk to any manipulation uh, researchers. Is to me is really, really, really challenging. We don't have a nearly uh, close uh, intelligence. So we're actually thinking about using human in the loop. So I'll show you a video of um, Hermes. Interesting how I'll skip some of those intro. Uh, <coughs> we look, we, uh, this robot is decommissioned at this point, but uh, it was a good experiment. We uh, understand a lot of things. We realize a lot of things. How difficult to control a robot like this using whole whole, whole body teleoperation. And then we made quite a progress. Um, the whole body body capture. Uh, is done by this robotic <coughs> linkages that I can also apply forces on the body. Uh, so it's like whole body haptics basically. And it can keep the operator safe in any real dangerous uh, application. And it has a body uh, balance feedback. This one is really simple algorithm, but I'll show you something better uh, right now. <laughs> so if you imagine sending this kind of robot in dangerous situation, you have to apply really high forces on the ground, on the environment. Uh, you have to control your body. That video looks easy, that's really hard. Really, really hard to balance while you're swinging that kind of axe. Uh, it's so mind-boggling easy if you do that by yourself. So basically, we're trying to combine the best mobility uh, with uh, humor in the loop manipulation, so we can basically bring our capability, human capability, maybe some uh, reduced capability, anywhere we can send instead of human, so we can save lives in dangerous situations. Um, this is a, a Hermes platform, now it's small, but it's much better uh, suited for experiment. Uh, it has a, its own uh, balance controller, uh, but this robot is also built by the same kind of principle, so it can actually handle shocks and absorb energy very well and pretty fast, and now we, uh, this guy... Uh, it's doing the proper effective control. Yep. Yeah. So he basically coupled this robot with the human, and capturing the essence of the human, he only looked at the COM and COP, and in planar motion, he used um, uh, divert, divergent component uh, motion, right, moment, or divergent component moment, which is that he, he, he thinks is the best thing to synchronize each other. Uh, so that has a little bit of prediction involved. Uh, so that makes the robot and human uh, step in sync. Even though they're only side half. And then he showed that in simulation, he can do that whatever size using his algorithm. Because the uh, non-dimensionalization actually works there. Uh, and the crit one of the critical parts is actually human feedback. Human feedback actually apply certain forces to match with the different scale of the robot. So in the future, we're trying to use a mobile robot to apply high forces in the environment, which cannot be done by just moving a limb. You have to move your entire body to generate high forces because you're not anchored on the ground, as I mentioned. We're also generating, uh, building the force sensors. I just want to briefly mention it. Uh, one of the key problems of the conventional torque sensor is a lot of inertia noise because it, it's made how it made. Our sensor doesn't have a much inertia noise, yet it actually gets the same amount of forces. Uh, this is a sampling basis, very different uh, approaches. And yeah, I'll 
I'll skip this. This is a little bit different topic. Uh, I would like to show you our new direction of research. We're trying to do the teleoperation with the force feedback, which is an old topic. But uh, uh, we believe that we can actually build a better system, better build, uh, other using our solar actuation technology. This one, I can feel all the forces of the interaction of the other, the other arm. Uh, this is actually probably the highest stiffness uh, executed in this kind of harsh dynamic environment. Any force feedback uh, would have been made it uh, unstable. So we're building now six stop machine, five dollar six stop machine like this and master and slave to actually uh, like replicate our manipulation technique. I just want to like uh, aware, or, like make you aware how challenging a simple, seemingly simple task moving a person, not even paralyzed person, just weak person from bed to the wheelchair. And he's constantly talking, you have to communicate, and how each contact, how delicate the contact should be. It's pretty mind boggling. I'm not really sure we're gonna use a humanoid robot, but this is a represent how challenging uh, any physical interaction services in the future will be. And it ranges from typical product picking, agriculture, construction. Construction is not dealing with the delicate stuff, but and definitely other care. There are many areas we have to really think about how to develop a dynamic machine that can safely interact with the environment. So this is my uh, last slide, and thanks for your uh, attention. I think time is a little over. Uh, but Yes. Yeah, uh, very inspiring talk. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, uh, do you always maximize your stiffness in your robotic to get better control? Yeah. Or do, you, do you have any compliance in it? You want There's to... no compliance. Uh, we're talking about transmission stiffness from the motor to the end detector. Uh -huh. And uh, this, uh, a lot of energy absorption you saw is actually going through the motor. Okay. Yeah. So we have a compliance, but those are all virtual compliance. What do you mean by virtual compliance? Uh, you, you apply, imagine you have a force source and then you have a displacement, you can generate whatever force you can. Yeah. And then that's how you create a virtual arm. Have you, if you play, have you played with a uh, haptic device, phantom arm? Those are all the same way. They just never publish. That's why they're not very aware uh, available for people. There's no force on sensor whatsoever. <clears throat> That's how you work in your leg too. That's how our arm is actually absorbing energy. Not because our tendons are compliant. Your muscle actually can operate that way. Okay. Yeah. So it's actually pretty much the same. <clears throat> the, the energy uh, absorbed in the motor is turned into the neck. The motor becomes a, a generator? It's yes, like, uh, like but the efficiency depends on what, what you're doing. Because the, uh, I score our heat generation, the torque generation cost is always wasted. The same for more uh, human too. Human never regenerate, but the torque generation, force generation cost is dominant. <coughs> yes? So you mentioned there are two, like these two phases where energy is absorbing one and energy is released in other one. Like, do they, do they have to switch between these two modes? No, it's just current control just keep uh, gate either way. And in the when the robot is running, we never like the, the battery never receive energy because when one leg is regenerating, the other leg is, is consuming. So net uh, generation never goes negative. Uh, uh, generation never go positive unless you're jumping or landing. When you're jumping, landing, battery voltage actually went up. This is just a very standard uh, coron control scheme. It's nothing, nothing new. Yes. So I mean, th these are just like insane concepts, and, and I'm just kind of wondering, as an undergraduate, how do you, how much of this is hard analytical research, and how much of this is your guys' own creativity and trying to come up with ways to accomplish your objectives? So, for example, how you teach this, right? Right. So. Um, Hard to explain. That's actually one of the headache I've been having as a faculty member. What should I teach? I actually teach a class based on these, and uh, I have to let them really play with it. So this this is uh, something we've been doing pretty poorly as an educator. 
we give them a material you can consume in a lecture format, and then you can repeat in a formal format, and then when they, when they do well, that's great education, and then they give you great, great feedback. That's not real education. We have to make them understand better than just consuming knowledge. I think we can consume, they can consume knowledge by looking at the website and they look at the book. So in our class, we actually let them actually build and deal with the real machine, and then understand through their hand. And that's the only way they can understand control and they can understand robotics. So I'm not really sure how to formalize in a way that more people can. So that's why we kept 40 students in our, in our class, and then everyone actually play with their impedance controlled arm and so on. So it is, it is still a dilemma to me, but I, at least uh, on these topics, I think my students that took classes actually learned something significantly different from other classes. Yeah. In, in your, just to follow up on it, was in your own, your own PhD students or undergrads or something, do they come in knowing how to build things? Or like, have you been oh. successful transferring your uh, building expertise to anyone? That so can... building design expertise, I don't think we can give anyone at this point. Uh, that's something really hard. A lot of people ask like how to design a class, how to teach a design. And that's why a lot of like this automated design like methodology, I still don't believe that design can be learned in a structured way. Uh, especially the, the design like this. Uh, I think design is sort of like uh, your, uh, your shopping, your shopper. You're going to shop in a tool, tool shop, and then oh, I want to buy drill, I want to buy saw. Like your designer, you should be able to shop around and know enough material that I want to use this to like change my door, for example. I think designer should be, and then designer doesn't need to be a tool creator. So we created a tool, probably one like I me did most most of the design of the cheetah, the, the concept of the actuator. None of my students would create a concept of new actuator, right? You can unlearn and then re re relearn. That's a, impossible to teach. Uh, so they are a user of that tool now. I can't teach them to reinvent something else. That's really hard to teach. So I, in my opinion, teaching design is basically make them an efficient shopper and then know how to use them and then combine them. And that's actually how you're supposed to teach. Creating a new concept design is very, very hard. If somebody invent a harmonic drive and then, oh, so you're a great designer, can you teach to somebody else? I don't think uh, that person can teach other people to be like him. I think that's very hard. Uh, but I force them to think high level a lot. That's another kind of aspect as a designer. Like, apply this uh, analysis, apply this in an FEM. Does it really help you understand high level what is important? Like inertia is important, the friction is important. And then do we need to force feedback or not? This decision you can have without, with the, any tools and available in the control class or design material class manufacturing class, you're not gonna get that answer. You need to play with it, you need to measure things, you need to understand dynamics, and then you might be able to make the decision. So, yeah, it's a challenge to me. Uh, I don't know how to effectively teach the student without pushing them to play with and feel and then make things burn. And um, So we still uh, push them to play with the real hardware and break things. Okay, because time is still we have to cut. Uh, thank you for